Hi everyone, I'm Bill Vasilakis, the Senior Minister of Christian Family Centre Churches and the lead pastor of our mother church at Seaton. We're located at 185 Frederick Road, between Trimmer Parade and Grange Road by the railway line, and we've been operating in the western suburbs of Adelaide for 44 years. And uh, our desire is to add value to our community and to be a blessing to all people. We love Jesus Christ, we love people, and uh, we are on Channel 44 because we want to be a help to you in your spiritual journey, particularly if it's your first time uh, tuning in. Uh, it's my prayer that uh, God will really speak to you through this service, the singing, the prayers, uh, the ministry of the Word, and also a time where you can respond to Jesus Christ personally and receive grace and mercy and help in your time of need. Enjoy the service.
know we're living in a time where so much is shifting and changing. But can I invite us today to fix our focus of our heart and our mind on what is unchanging. The love that God has for you is real and it will never ever change. He will never walk away. So come on, we're gonna celebrate church. We're gonna sing about the love of our God. It always remains, it never changes. So let's sing together. It's higher than the mountains that I face. It's stronger than the power of the grave. It's constant in the trial and the change. This one thing remains. This one thing, this one thing remains. Your love, your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me.
Folks, I don't want you to miss the significance of the words we've just sang. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 says, For he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. This is not a hope that just says, Oh, I hope something good will happen. This hope is alive. And I want every single person standing here this morning to just pause for a minute and to experience the living hope of Jesus. All of us have got a list of things that we think are beyond hope or that we can't solve or fix. But then the experience comes to us through God's Holy Spirit of the living hope. And I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes and, and maybe even stretch out your hands in front of you as an act of receiving the living hope of God. It was an act of just acknowledging that God gives you a hope that's beyond understanding. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the fact that when we did not have an answer, when we couldn't bridge the chasm, when we couldn't climb the mountain, that you came to us and you gave us a hope that's, inside, that's alive inside of us today. And Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who hasn't experienced that hope before or isn't sure about it, Lord, that even right now you would touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit. 
even right now, you would reassure them, there is hope because I live. And Lord, for the rest of us who have been walking with you for some time now, Lord, renew us in your living hope. Allow us to experience the resurrection of your spirit again. Lord, we can only say thank you, thank you, thank you for rescuing us when we had no hope so that now we can live in hope. We pray in your matchless name. Amen. Amen. It is great to be in church together today and just to be celebrating the goodness of God and the hope that we have. If you're our guest here this morning, we're delighted that you have joined us here at the Christian Family Centre. We love it when people are with us for the first time or the first time in a long time. And uh, we trust that you're already sensing uh, the fellowship of God's Spirit and, and a warm welcome here today. So great to have you with us. You can take your seats. It's, uh, it's getting a little bit cooler at the moment. Winter's not too far away. But uh, here at the Christian Family Centre, we're never dormant. Uh, there's always something going on in the life of the church. So why don't we just check in with the church news team and finding out what's happening in the life of the church right now. Welcome to Church News. Let's find out what is happening in the life of our church. Do you need prayer for healing or over a hardship that you're currently facing? Our next healing clinic is coming up on May 30th. And these are really powerful times where we have our pastors and leaders stand with you and believe for signs and wonders and miracles to take place. Make sure you're there for our next healing clinic, 1 p.m. after lunch in the shed. Our next churchwide team night is on the 15th of June. If you serve anywhere in the life of that church, make sure and come and get filled and encouraged. Stay tuned for more details. If you want to find out more about what's going on across church, including kids, youth and other programs, make sure you check us out on our website, familycenter.org.au or check out any of our other social media platforms. Well, that just about wraps it up for Church News this week. We hope you enjoy the rest of the service and we'll see you next week. Bye. Fantastic. Thank you, Declan and Rachel. And another thing that's going on in the life of our church is our youth camp and uh, our youth co-leader, Nick Sanford, has joined us to tell us a little bit about that. What's happening, Nick? Awesome. Hey, I'll be giving you oh, two seconds. Youth camp, July 15th to the 17th, July, the school holidays. If you know a teenager, whether it's a sibling, um, a niece, nephew, a neighbor, whoever you know that is a teenager in year six to 12, we want them along to youth camp this year. So early bird ends next Sunday. $69. We have never had prices so outrageously low for a youth camp. So make sure. Parents, I know you might shed a tear if you don't register your four young people before next Sunday. The regular price will be $90 after that, but make sure you do that. Young people, register. Everybody register. It's going to be phenomenal. Thank you so much. God bless you. Okay, so check that out, folks, uh, and uh, make sure you take advantage of that early bird price for youth camp and the school holidays. Sounds great, Nick. Well, it's now uh, our opportunity to uh, collect up our tithes and offerings, which we do here at church every week. Uh, there's a lot uh, in God's Word that uh, gives us encouragement in relation to our giving. And uh, one of those verses is 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. It begins uh, with these words, God is able to bless you abundantly. And sometimes we just think that's really exciting. I'm just going to take that and God's going to bless me. And, and that's a promise I love. But it goes on but wait there's more it says so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work folks God is able to bless us abundantly it's true but you know it's not just about us it's so that we are equipped and able to give to do good works to abound in generosity in all things at all times and that includes this offering so I really want you to be encouraged today that God is a blesser of your giving. God is an encourager of your giving. And if you have an abundance, I just encourage you to give today. But even if it's not so big, just know that the little that you have is designed 
to send a message to other people. I just want to pray for our offering today, for our encouragement. You can do uh, your offering electronically. The bank account details are on the screen and you're welcome to use those. If you want to do cash, you can put that in the containers outside our main doors in the foyer after the service and give that way. But just allow me to pray for you now as we prepare to give this offering today. Lord, we thank you for your promise that you are able to bless us abundantly. But Lord, we want to acknowledge that the purpose of that blessing is so that we can be generous towards others, so that we can be generous towards you, but so that we can also abound in all things, on all occasions, that we can do good works. Lord, we thank you for the goodness that you have rained down upon us. And Father, we just say, help us to be generous on this occasion and on every other time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to be uh, experiencing the next instalment of our series, The Unstoppable Force. And our senior minister, Pastor Bill Vasilakis, has joined us for the next instalment. Please give him a hand. Good morning. Great to be together as we continue this key thought that we are the unstoppable force of Jesus to a world that's uh, deeply troubled. People, we do have a problem in our world, in our, in our nation. Um, someone said that hell begins when hope ends. And if hope dies, what life can remain? We are living in a time when people are, are questioning more than ever, what is life really all about? And there's a terrible culture of despair and, and death that is pervading Australia and the Western world in particular. You don't see it in Africa and Asia and, uh, and, and Latin America so much, but certainly in the Western world. Mental and emotional illnesses are at epidemic proportions. 65,000 of our fellow Aussies attempt to take their life every year. That's an awful lot of people. 3,000 succeed, over 3,000. That's nine people a day, nine people today. And if you quantify those nine people, each person would have a sphere of influence, those who love them and connected with them to say, 20, 30, 40, 50 people. And for those of us who have experienced that in our lives, and in my family we have, uh, where a family member, extended family member took their own life, and 10 years ago, but the implications of that are still being felt powerfully. And, uh, but it's symptomatic that we have a lot of deep issues within our culture. Divorce relationship disintegration, family dysfunction is just deadly for people. It's deadly. There are no redeeming features of it. There are, of course, exceptions where, and at times I've actually advised people that they should end that marriage because of, you know, the woman could be killed or there could be, the person might be a serial adulterer and uh, so there are exceptions, obviously, where you have to advise people and, and it's the, the only course, the painful course of action. But, you know, this moral and ethical slide, and in particular through domestic violence and abuse, I mean, it's, it's, it's having a catastrophic effect on individuals and uh, people's personal well-being. Um, one woman a week, over one woman a week, 65 I think it is, the last 12 months, gets murdered by a partner. Murdered, like killed. <laughs> and, um, and then there are countless numbers that are beaten and assaulted. Um, the federal government in the last budget this week is actually saying they want to provide housing for battered women, to get them out of those situations and provide something for them and their kids. Um, because they're the new poor when they lose everything and they've got nowhere to go. Um, so today, when people's personal moorings have shifted and so many don't know what to believe anymore, 
or even who they can really trust in this rapidly changing world. The hope deficit is at an all-time high. I've never seen our society, our nation in such need, personal, spiritual, emotional needs in all my years. And so church family, it's genuine Christ followers who really do have the answer. And the answer is a person. His name is Jesus. He really is the answer to people's lives. And our world is in, in a desperate state and it needs him. It doesn't need religion. It needs him to know who he is and to understand what he's done and, and what he's doing from heaven and, and the gift of the spirit that he has sent and the fact that, that he can bring marvelous healing and deliverance and impart hope to people in, in, in a world that is in such a hopeless situation. You and I are God's unstoppable force because we have a living, transformative hope. And I've worded this carefully. It's a living hope and a transformative hope. And I want you to get this because I want to use a couple of passages from from the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul that talk about a living hope and a transformative hope. And whether you're here on site at Seton or you're on one of our media platforms or Channel 44, I trust these thoughts will be helpful to you, that it'll impart hope and help you to understand that the, the person whom we put our trust in, Jesus Christ, is alive and he can transform us and give us what we need. And so I want to read from, from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Three truths all people need to hear. This is our living hope. Firstly, that Jesus can redeem you from your past. He says these words, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? In his great mercy. I love this. Such a beautiful statement. In his great mercy because of his love and grace and goodness, not because of anything that we had done or could do. It says, in his great mercy, he has given us a gift of new birth. You've come alive. You've been reborn. You've been transformed. Your past has been dealt with through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because he rose and is alive, so new life can come into us. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead and he died for the sins of the world, we would still be in our sins. We, if forgiveness could not be affected. Salvation could not occur. He had to rise from the dead, victorious over what put him to death, our sins, death, despair. And he rose and went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to inhabit us and to say, now, you are a people of hope. And uh, I can redeem you from your past, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how many sins you've committed, no matter how many sins have been committed against you, new life, new birth can transform your past and give you a new beginning. Then secondly, Jesus can secure your eternal future. He says this, and we have, in verse four, a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. I love this. It's pure, it's undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Hey, all your earthly material possessions that are all going to pass away. You know, we value them so much, but you know what, they pass away. That's the reality of, of what Peter is saying here. People need this, people need to know that we have a living, transformative hope. Jesus can redeem you from your past and he can secure your eternal future. And thirdly, Peter says he can protect you in the present. In verse five, and through your faith, you gotta work with God. It's not God breaking down the door of your life, it's your faith, you're connecting with him. God is protecting you by his power. It's his power that protects, it's your faith that taps into him, trusting him, calling on him until you receive the salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Jesus is guarding your life from heaven and he is never asleep on the job. When it says, protecting you the Greek word for Rio actually means guarding garrisoning it's a bit like Windsor Castle I've been there can't get it out of my head those walls were so thick you tried to get there you couldn't do it when William the Conqueror built that thing or we started building it they built a great big moat 
So you would have had to cross that thing and there were spikes in it and probably crocodiles and snakes and who knows what was there. And uh, you, you, it was just impregnable. It's like, try and get me. I'm impregnable. I have a fortress. It's still there, a thousand years old. Well, it says here that Jesus is protecting you. He's built a Windsor Castle in your life. Nothing can come in and nothing can come out until the day when all will be revealed. When, when he wraps everything up. He's guarding your life from heaven. And folks, he will not sleep on the job. He's watching, he's praying, he's interceding. He's saying, Holy Spirit, that situation. Peter says, this is a safe, stable and sure hope. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, he secured your salvation for eternity. It's a hope that holds the future in the present because it's anchored in the past. Our hope is anchored in the past because Jesus rose from the dead. Our hope remains in the present because Jesus is alive. Our hope is complete in the future because Jesus is coming back to wrap everything up. Hallelujah. That's what Peter says. It's a living hope. And people need this. They need their lives to be redeemed, their past to be dealt with, that their sins can be forgiven, that the sins that have been committed against them can be healed. Their traumas can be healed. They can be reborn supernaturally by the presence of God as they place their trust in him. They can, they can have a security that they know where they're going. They have meaning and purpose in life. People don't know who to believe and what to believe and who to trust. I believe in Jesus. I trust in him. He's the safest pair of hands in the universe. I know where I'm going. Should I leave this, this life? I'm going to be with him. And I tell you, that secures you. That stabilizes you. That, that fortresses your life. And Paul, I love Paul and Peter. In Romans 5, verses 1 to 8, he focuses on the transformative nature of the hope that we have through Jesus. That's why I've called this message a living transformative hope. And I want to read these scriptures, but firstly, he's saying to us, Jesus produces overcoming fruit so you can handle life's problems and difficulties. He's saying to us in this passage, and I'll read it in a few moments, we enjoy the peace that comes from being made right with God, but we still face daily problems that God uses to help us grow, to understand more about Jesus and to become overcomers. He says this, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, Romans 5, 1 to 4, being made right in God's sight, that's justification, righteousness. We've been made right in God's sight by simple childlike trusting in who Jesus is and what he's done for us on a cross you can't make yourself right before God it comes as you put your trust in he who's the only one that can make you right before God he who took the barrier between a perfect God and sinful humanity the only one that can deal with your sins your guilt your fear your shame he took it on the cross and he says now he goes, I, I can make you right before God the Father by faith. And then we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. A peace that's eternal. It's not feeling peace. It's a right status. It's a right relationship that now we can say, this never changes. Irrespective of my conduct, even I might be up and down and I might be a bit cool towards God sometimes, but he doesn't change. The relationship is secure. Hey, marriage is relationship. Hey, I got this ring. I got this ring. I made a commitment. Now, my fellowship with my wife and her fellowship with me, at times it could be a little bit, a little bit testy, a little bit, but it doesn't mean that's it. No more relationship. No, no, no. Fellowship is something we've got to keep working on. Learning to forgive, learning to love, learning to adjust. But it doesn't change the basis of the relationship. God the Father has stabilized. You have a relationship with him. He doesn't change. You may change. He says, okay, the fellowship's a bit tight, but I still love you and I, I'm on to you. you. You do need to repent. You do need to change your mindset here and put your trust in me and learn the word and be regular at church and serve. These things help you in your fellowship, but the relationship is secure. Therefore, 
since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Isn't that fantastic? Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. Oh, what a wonderful statement. Undeserved privilege. Where we now stand, we stand in grace. We have access to God the Father. And we confidently and joyfully look to walk forward to sharing God's glory. Wow. We enjoy the peace that comes from being made right with God. But then he goes on to say, but you face daily problems. There are life issues that God will use to help you understand yourself better, Jesus, and to cling on to Jesus more and to be changed, to become more like him. He says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Hey, rejoice when you run into problems and trials. See, a person doesn't have hope. He doesn't know their past has been dealt with. He's not secure about their future. And he understands that, that God is alive, Jesus is alive to help them in their present. They can't rejoice when they have problems. We rejoice in suffering not because we like pain. We're not masochists. Anyone who says, yeah, bring it on, more suffering, more pain. Something wrong with them. We rejoice not because we like pain or we deny its tragedy. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm just rejoicing, I'm just rejoicing, I'm okay. That's just ridiculous. If you're in pain, you're in pain. If you're suffering, you're suffering and it hurts like hell at times and it can be really tough. Life can be cruel as well as being absolutely beautiful. Life can send you a curveball tomorrow and you're just living your life and then all of a sudden, whack. What do you do? People don't cope. If they don't have a living hope, they can't transform them. They don't know what to do. The world's in great need. People are, are, are in crisis. That's why we are the unstoppable force. We have the answer in Jesus Christ. People need to know about him. And they, can't, they won't know by just coming to church. People just don't come to church because oh, I need to find hope. You are the church. The church is not the building. The church is not even a, a Christian service. The church is the people where you are tomorrow. You're going into some hopeless, difficult situations. You scratch the surface and you'll find a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of hopelessness, a lot of injury. And people don't, lost their moorings. They don't know who to, who to talk to. He says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope in salvation. So we rejoice in suffering, not because we like pain or deny it's, it's tragedy, but because we know God is using it and he's going to use life's difficulties and even Satan's attacks to build our character. And this is why people who don't have hope are not resilient. Something happens and they just fall over. No wonder the... the, the the emotional and mental illness is skyrocketing. There's a plank missing in, in our peoples, our, our, our fellow Aussies, in a life. It's no fault of their own. I think we've got, to, we, we've got to realize that, you know what? People are not resilient today. The slightest thing can actually knock them over. And, and Paul says here, you can rejoice in suffering when you know who you put your trust in, you know who has changed your past, you know your future, you know where you're heading, you know you have help for today as well as a hope for tomorrow. And even if Satan attacks, he is not God. He is not sovereign. Jesus is sovereign. We can have a most positive outlook, even in times of suffering, because Jesus is totally sovereign, 100% sovereign. He is totally good. He is always in control, even in the most trying of circumstances. And some of you today are facing some trying circumstances. Things that happen. My wife and I are facing one. Not ourselves personally, but someone we, we dearly love. It's, it's, it's an agony. It's really difficult. Our pastoral team are aware. They're praying for us. But it's really hard. It's very difficult. It's painful. And I don't know how people cope with this outside of a strong faith in a living Jesus who imparts hope and who can give the power that we need to transform our hearts and lives when we go through these difficult times. 
So Paul says it produces overcoming fruit so you can handle life's problems and difficulties. Secondly, Jesus provides his all-powerful Holy Spirit to work through you. He says, and this hope, in verse 5, will not lead to disappointment. In other words, it ain't just, okay, it's just in the future. Yeah, okay, you, you're going to get to heaven one day. That's it. Imagine God says, that's it. You're saved, your past is dealt with, your, 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 your future is assured, now I'm just not involved anymore. Just get on with life until the day you die, then everything will be okay. Like past dealt with, future secured, but the present, you're on your own. You know, like a de deism is like that. D-E-I-S-M. Deism is a, a form of, perverted form of Christianity that was in the 1700s, 1800s. said, well, God made everything. Possibly he redeemed us through Christ, but he doesn't get involved with us. You're on your own. You work out your own problems. God helps those who help themselves. He's not actively involved. It's the opposite of the gospel where Jesus came to earth, looked us in the eye and says, I'm one of you. I'm a human being like you. Walked among us, ate, drank, suffered, and then died in our place, went back to heaven and he, it says that he aches for us. He prays for us. He intercedes for us. He's our advocate, our mediator, our defense attorney our supporter, our big brother in heaven who's always looking out for us. And so, but, but it, it, he sent the Holy Spirit. Have a look at this. You see, our relationship with God begins with faith, which helps us to realize that we're delivered from our past by Christ's death. Hope grows. It grows us as we learn that God has in mind, you know, what God has in mind for us. And, uh, and all the things, the wonderful things. It gives us the promise of the future. And it says, and love, notice this, and love though, fills our lives and gives us the ability to reach out to others. We need supernatural love to live in this world that's full of hate and bitterness and resentment and ugliness. Love is the answer. The Holy Spirit, when he comes into your life, he baptizes you, fills you with love, God's love. And it says the Holy Spirit will, sh will cause the love of God to be shed abroad in your heart. It'll flow. You'll have a supernatural ability to live and love like Jesus in some of the most difficult situations where some people are just not lovable <laughs> or not likable, that you can still reach out to them. He says this, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. Have a look at this in verse 5. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. We need that today. We need his all-powerful spirit to keep flooding our hearts with love. We now have the supernatural power, folks, to express Christ's love in the most difficult relationship settings. Jesus' love is limitless because the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. And it can neutralize any toxic, toxicity in you. In our dealings with other people, it's so easy for negativity and, and a little bit of poison of to, to come in and attitude. And, and it's difficult to love like Jesus. It's so easy for an attitude of a little bit of bitterness, a little bit of resentment, anger to affect relationships. And, and, and if it grows too big, it can destroy relationships. <laughs> shouldn't say that I think it but I shouldn't say it oh Jesus how many times I say oh, Jesus help me I'm thinking it I know I can't say it oh Lord I need your supernatural power and presence I need your love to neutralize that toxic thing that's there within when I'm feeling like I want to hit back Jesus hanging on a cross what they did to him was just outrageous they murdered him in front of his mother and people that loved him and, and these, these executioners are not nice people I think Mel Gibson captured it the nature of, of a Roman executioner most executioners have to dope up on drugs and alcohol and, and psych themselves up because they have to kill another human being and I think Mel in his film The Passion you look at those guys man they're horrible awful so Jesus wasn't saying, give me more, I love the pain. Strike me again. He hated what they did to him. 
It was ugly. It was horrible. He cried out to his father. He even said in, in Gethsemane, if it's possible, God, take this cup from me. I can't do it. And then, he, then he yielded and submitted the deepest kind level of faith. And he says, not my will, but your will be done. How many times do we have to pray that prayer? It, it's, it's your will, Lord. He didn't want to go through with it from a human level. He knew what was in store. Separation from the Father, the brutality of the Roman executioners. They usually executed them naked. You know, we've, we've sanitized it all. It's a brutal affair. In front of his mum and the other women. Shamed them. Stuck a crown of thorns on his head and said, now you think you're a king. It was brutal. It was horrible. They flayed his back. They didn't just tap him. They opened up his back and his front. Tore open the skin. That would kill you the little bits of bone on that whip that would just tear away your flesh so your, your bones can be exposed. I mean, it was brutal. That would kill a person. It was unpleasant. It was horrible. But what did he do? When he's on the cross, he's able to save an, a murderer, thief, next to him. Where'd that love come from? Just today, you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't tell off the other murderer who's a naughty boy. He's just naughty, you know, he's putting Jesus down and, and the other one tells him off. But Jesus ignores that, but he says, yeah, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then these guys that are just horrible human beings that given the, themselves over to the dark side, very demonic, he finds something he can say to the Father, forgive them, because they're dumb. They don't know what they're doing. They're ignorant. Hey, he found something. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And that forgiveness came upon all of us to effect forgiveness no matter what we've done none of us have done what those Roman executioners have done if he could forgive them he can forgive you he can change you and not remember your sin deal with your past secure your future and provide the help that you need for today his all-powerful Holy Spirit enables us to live like him and to love like him and to neutralize any negative toxicity that you might have and today you might be struggling with some things I'd like to pray for you that you say you know what that's me I need help Jesus love will equip you with the ability to display this selfless proactive generous love in the many difficult settings you may find yourself in so you'll find yourself in some difficult settings and uh, in painful settings, and difficult people, and um, even good people sometimes do some strange things. That's a bit weird. That's a bit hurtful. Wow, that's a bit insensitive. That's not considering the best interests of that person. You think, oh, okay. And it's so easy, church, to let an attitude come in that starts to affect us, whereas we're to be like Jesus. If we're going to be the, the unstoppable force to be the voice of hope for our world, by golly, it's got to be working in our lives. It's got to be working in our lives. The third thing he says, Jesus' love propels you to be his voice of hope to our lost world. I love this. When Paul is saying, hey, in Romans 5, this transformative hope, produces overcoming fruit so you can handle life's problems and difficulties this transforming hope provides his all-powerful spirit to work through you and then he actually tells us what this love actually you you want to define love he says let's get away from the mushy emotional stuff let's look at Jesus you want to know what love is this is as you see at just the right time when we were still powerless helpless helpless and in a hopeless state we were helpless and hopeless we couldn't do anything about our spiritual state about our salvation Christ died for the godly and the very good people of this planet so what it says he died for the ungodly he didn't say well I'll wait till you become a a better boy Luke I'll give you my Holy Spirit when you do this and do that no I'll give you salvation, Martin, when you are a better husband. I'll give you 
salvation if. But if you just repent a little bit, you know, just change your attitude beforehand, then I'll rush it. No, no, no. It doesn't say that. It says you were ungodly. In other words, you were anti-God. You were, well, if you weren't anti-God, you weren't interested in God. You ignored God. Like in the days of Noah, to eat, drink it and be merry, tomorrow we die. Just ignoring God. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless and in a helpless, hopeless state, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and me. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates. This is not feeling. This is demonstration. You can see it in action. Demonstrates his own love for you in this. While you were a sinner, Christ died for you. Our world needs to hear that. We need to experience its emotional impact, that it will just wreck you when you think about it, when you look at the cross and see he did it for you, when you're in an ungodly state, when you were sinful and he didn't wait for you to turn to him, he actually reached out to you and the ability for you to put your trust in him, even that came from his Holy Spirit drawing you. I trust these two passages, just 1 Peter 1 verses 3 to 5 and Romans 5, 1 to 8, are helpful to you. You may want to read them, reflect on them, write them out. But as I was praying over my message, and uh, I felt these two scriptures, I felt, I just want to share what Peter and Paul said about living hope, a transformative hope. For us to be the voice of hope. As we're standing in the Lord's presence, maybe you're going through a really tough time. You're facing a situation, a curveball, a relationship breakdown, something that's happened and you're really feeling it. There might be a little bit of the poison of bitterness rising up. Admit it. That's human. That's not sin. That's just human. I'm struggling. You want to react. You want to say something. You want to do something. That's where you call out. That's what I, I just call out, Lord. I said, I, I don't want to say it. I'm thinking it, but help me, Jesus. Right from the start, help me get rid of that little bit of poison. Let your love through your Holy Spirit just neutralize that. Enable me, Lord. Enable me. I want to be like Jesus in that situation. And when you're not and you muck up, you've got to then repent. You've got to then say, okay, I'm sorry to God and to the person. Everything's forgivable. We're human. We make mistakes. You may have done that. But if you're facing this today, here in this place, maybe if you're viewing on Channel 44 or on our other platforms, you're struggling. Reach out to Jesus now. And I'd like to, I'd like to reach out to Jesus just by extending my hands. To say, Lord, I yield to you. I submit to you. I can't change my heart. I can't change that person. I can't heal my body. I can't heal that other person. I can't solve that. But Lord, you're the God of the impossible. And I yield to you. You're the answer. And with open hands, I receive, Lord, that gift of the Spirit, that, that enablement of the Spirit, that charisma, that gift that I need in my life or that you want to give me that I can impart to somebody else. Lord, I yield to you. If you're struggling with an attitude, something's gone down and you're really struggling, reach out to him now and say, Lord, just touch my heart, touch my life. I don't, I want to act like Jesus. I don't want to act like the devil. I don't want to act as I was BC. I'm living in AD. You're in my life, Jesus, and I want you to guide and lead me. Touch me now. I yield to you and I receive from you. And I also pray for that person, that person that's in your world that is in a helpless, hopeless situation that needs the Lord. I pray, Lord, give us all wisdom, give us sensitivity, help us to be respectful, 
as we pray for them and we ask you, Lord, to open the door where we can share the living, transformative hope that we have in Jesus that they need. Lord, even this week, for people that we bump into casually, open our eyes and arrange situations where we can, in fact, minister to that person at a personal, private, encouraging time to give them hope, tell them we're praying for them, thinking of them, imparting something of a the loving disposition of Jesus. We pray, help us to be the unstoppable force. Help us to be your voice of hope. Oh, through Jesus we pray. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a commitment of your life to Jesus and you've personally received him, please make contact with us as we would love to help you understand more about who Jesus is and what he's done and the marvellous plans he has for your life. In fact, I would encourage you to read one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the beginning of the New Testament, and discover for yourself the wonder of, of his words and the incredible encouragement he was to so many people when he walked this earth, and he can be and will be for you. If uh, you would like to make contact with any of our pastors or attend any of our services, you're, you're most welcome. Uh, at uh, our Seaton campus. Until we meet again next week, every blessing.